This episode is brought to you by the American Home Brewers Association, a community of more than 40,000 fermentation enthusiasts from around the world. Visit homebrewersassociation.org for recipes, brewing tips, and conversation. That's homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, July 30th, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Steve Wilkes and I sample hop sampler number 17. This time, we take a detour off the beaten path and venture into blending. We taste Galaxy and Centennial alone, and then a blend of the two. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewing logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you want to support us financially, check out Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing. And many thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And the financial supporters this week have gotten an early release of our video episode on what I'm calling a triple saison. It's uh, got a base that's sort of triple-ish with the uh, Napoleon yeast from Imperial that's saisonish. Whatever it is, it's delicious. Uh, my next brewing project is a sizer. I picked up three pounds of uh, local honey from a beekeeper who lives right here in town. Uh, He's a young guy who's built up a reputation for uh, capturing swarms of bees out, uh, you know, people's houses and stuff and cleaning out beehives from the eaves and walls and such as that of people's houses. And uh, consequently, he has around 50 hives of his own now. His name is Caleb Hutcherson, and I'm hoping that I can have him on the show. Uh, The honey I got is very nice. Uh, It's not super sweet. Uh, and I detected sort of a, a a peppery character, as in bell pepper. Uh, my wife Susan says that she didn't taste that. But uh, either way, that honey is uh, going into the fermenter, and I hope, uh, this afternoon. I'm basing my sizer on a recipe from the website of our friends and new sponsors, Ricky and Kelly, from Groenfell Meadery up in Vermont. You've gotten to know Ricky and Kelly over the years from their appearances on the show. They are a family-owned open-source meadery. And that means if you go to uh, groenfell.com, you can read all about their practices and even get their recipes, just like I did. Uh, and the good part, or the, the better part, is you can order delicious Groenfell meads delivered right to your home. And uh, Ricky sent me a note with some fun news. Groenfell is launching a line of ethically sourced drinking horns. If you're a meat lover, you you got to have an ethically sourced drinking horn, right? From classic horns to drinking tankards to highball cups, this is the ultimate way to enjoy your mead. And for a limited time, Groenfell is also running mead and horn deals so that you can fill your horn the day it arrives. Fill up your horn with a delicious mead from online. And Ricky says that they still have some Root of All Evil Maple Edition available as well. And uh, that Root of All Evil, it's got t- 250 pounds of maple-infused ginger in a 1,000-gallon batch. It's a limited release and only available online at growenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L.com. I need to make up a jingle or something. Don't forget. <laughs> but if you Google, like I said last week, if you Google Groenfell Meadery and you misspell Groenfell in the most egregious way, Google, it'll find it for you. Uh, don't forget to check out also Ricky's YouTube channel. Just search for Ricky the Mead Maker and uh, get some tips uh, from uh, Ricky on making mead at home and, and send in your question. He, he can answer them for you. And get your mead and a horn to put the mead in at groenfell.com. G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L dot com. So happy that uh, Ricky and Kelly are uh, are sponsors now. Let's look into the mailbag. Jeff up in Anchorage, Alaska writes, 
I recently brewed a partial mash honey wheat ale, and upon concluding my brew day, I was thrilled that it went so well. That's always uh, <laughs> it's always a bad sign. <laughs> Jeff says, I hit all my numbers, not too difficult, with most, mostly extract, and then it suddenly occurred to me that I forgot to crush my specialty malt. Alas, the honey malt had gone into the mash uncrushed, and yet the color was exactly what I expected, and the flavor of the resulting beer was spot on. Maybe, he says. Jeff says, I think this could make for a good experiment. I'm thinking a side-by-side -side small batch brew, one with crushed specialty malt and the other with uncrushed. After all, all of the roasty character of the specialty malt is on the outside of the grain, right? Jeff says. Do you think there would be a difference in the resulting beers? Are you up to the challenge? <laughs> well, whether I'm up to the challenge or not is, is to be seen. <laughs> but that is an interesting question. Uh, you know, how much does crushing your specialty grains, especially in a uh, in an extract beer, how much does that actually make a difference? I got to think it does. I mean, let's take crystal malt f for an example. If you if you cut a, a, a kernel of crystal malt in half, I mean, you can see some crystallized sugar right inside there. However, you know, would would that sugar come through the husk? Would it seep through the husk if it's mashed, unmilled, or steeped? In, a, in an extract batch unmilled, I can see it, you know, I can see it maybe making less of a difference than, say, black patent, maybe, where the malt is roasted so highly that maybe the kernel would be weakened by that roasting process. But surely you'd get better extraction from crushing the grain. Has anybody out there accidentally done this experiment by forgetting to crush their specialty grains? Or, or maybe, you know, in the beginning when you were brewing extract, with steeping grains, maybe you didn't realize that you were supposed to be crushing those grains. Oh, drop me a line and let me know. Get, give me way in on this. I think it's a fairly, fairly obvious uh, uh, question, but maybe not. Let's talk about our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. Desiree and Dave have been pioneers and purveyors of electric systems for many, many years. Back when brewing electric seemed novel and sort of off the wall. Dave was in innovating and building electric controllers and other great gear right in the back of his store. And he's still at it. And uh, he and Desiree have a full line of Warthog electric controllers and turnkey systems for you to choose from at HighGravityBrew.com. And you can use the Build Your Own Brewing System feature on HighGravityBrew.com to customize your setup to fit the way that you brew and your budget. From single, dual, or three-vessel systems, and from five gallons to two barrels, HighGravityBrew.com has the electric kit that you need. And they even sell equipment from other manufacturers, too. But the Warthog systems have many years of real-life use to prove them, including professional applications like at Pippin's Taproom there at High Gravity. I have a Warthog brew in a bag system, and I love it. It's like having a brewing partner whose job it is to keep temps and boil strength steady and strong. Uh, check it all out at HighGravityBrew.com and use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your electric brewing purchase. That's at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. And we appreciate definitely appreciate greatly Desiree and Dave uh, and all the folks over at High Gravity being continued supporters uh, of this supporters of this <laughs> my Irish is coming out <laughs> being supporters of the show for so long okay this week's hop sampler was tasty but also challenging will Steve and I be able to tell the difference between galaxy and centennial alone and a blend of the two Steve Wilkes, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. We are uh, uh, we're distancing again. You there at uh, stevesbrewshop.com. Dot com. And uh, me in studio. What is this? Studio B? Studio A? That, that's, that's Studio... I call that Studio A. Okay. It's the main yeah. main audio studio. It's got the eggshell cartons on the wall. <laughs> it's got the. It's not Tyvek. <laughs> what is it? The uh, Soundex or whatever. Sound, the, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm just yeah. not going to do any fireworks in here because that's uh, sadly the that nightclub that burned up when they you know the oh, what was yeah. the, the 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 heavy metal band came in and they had the fireworks and all that stuff and they set, yep. set the sound tiles. That's that's <laughs> this stuff. So no fireworks in the studio. No. Uh, but that's boy, we've gotten off to a dark. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> we have just recorded uh, uh, two video episodes. In 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 all fairness and all full disclosure, uh, we've recorded the two video episodes with the uh, triple saison and the uh, black is beautiful uh, beer. Both of those uh, eight and a half percent alcohol. Uh, yep. That's not saying that we drank full servings of those because I, I I have in front of me for later. Uh, my half of the the portion of the uh, the triple, and then I handed off the other half of the the uh, black is beautiful uh, beer to my wife Susan, because uh, she loves the dark beers as do I. Speak for yourself. Uh, <laughs> both of those beers were were pretty pretty dang good. If I can pat myself on my own back, they were excellent. <laughs> so today we're 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 heading in a different direction on the hop sampler, Steve. Usually we do three different hops. Unless it's lemon drop, and we just do that every other show. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but this time, I decided to do a blend. So what we've yeah, got? Yeah, I like this. We, what we've got is we got one batch, one six pack I made that was just Galaxy. Mm -hmm. Another six pack I made that was just Centennial, and then the third was a half and half Galaxy and Centennial. So what do you think about this idea? I, I like the concept a lot because we normally don't brew as real as brewers. We normally don't brew smash beers. Right. So it's interesting to see how two hops play together and Centennial and galaxy are very popular hops, at least in my store they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's really interesting to see how they play and get along with each other. So that's a, it's a twist that we can put on, on the sampler. And I like it. I like the idea of it. And we're open to suggestions if uh, listeners want to, uh, you know, send in their suggestions of hop combinations that they would like to to uh, listen to because uh, you can't see. It's an audio show. But uh, yep. <laughs> if, you, if you want to want us to, uh, you know, and, and you could be sadistic if you think it would be the worst combination in the world. <laughs> <We're>, Absolutely. <laughs> now, I will, but I would give you this caveat. Uh, for. Uh, practical reasons, we try to do it within the hops that I carry in the store. Oh, that's true. And and I carry about eighty five different kinds, so there's a there's a nice selection. So if you go to go to my website, stevesbrewshop.com, <laughs> and it, it's I don't really mean that as a plug, but it's just a way to like you could look and see. Well, he carries that, and he carries that, and and you could do that. I'm not opposed to ordering some hops specifically for this show. But it's a lot easier if it's something I already carry. And while so you're, you're on, like, and while you're on stevesbrewshop.com, we just you know go on over to the kits and the. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I've got I've got a scratch and dent sale right now. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lightly, so come on down. <laughs> there's some lightly bruised mosaic. That's <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And we'll take your trade in, <laughs> as long as it's got a clean title. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Yeah. Uh, I'm your best buy here, pay here uh, homebrew shop in the world. <laughs> this may be a long show or a short show, depending. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, you're familiar with the, if you've listened to the, this is the, how many of these things do you think we've done? How many hop samplers do you think we've done? Me, you're asking me this? Yes. I I haven't got 20. This, well, I hate it when people, when you say, you know, you, you, you're going to release a staggering figure to them and then they overestimate and it's like, oh, no, it's only 17. It's 17. This is the 17th hop sampler. Wow. Yeah. Well, wasn't that far off? No. It's good. Wow. But in this one, in addition to the blending thing, I decided to, to add another twist to this whole thing. Usually we use a Pilsner light dry malt extract. This right. time I just, I decided to use pale ale dry malt extract. 
Nice. So it'd be interesting to see if we, you know, taste a difference uh, in the base in the in the beers. It's you know beers themselves, uh, but then uh, also with the the hops. So what I do is I brew three six packs of beer basically. I start out uh, with each batch with one pound or 450 grams of dry malt extract, and I add that to three quarts of water, and then I bring that up to uh, just up to boiling. Uh, you know, the, the the bubbles just start coming up from the bottom, uh, and then I add the hops, the amount of the hops, uh, and then I I put the lid on, I take the kettle off the heat, and I let that sit for 10 minutes to do a 10-minute hop stand. Then I put that into an ice bath, and it takes about 12, 15 minutes to, to cool down to, to fermentation temperature. And I rack that into a um, one-gallon jug, true and all, uh, and I add three grams of uh, USO5. And then it, when I bottle... I put one of the uh, Cooper's carbonation drops in each bottle, and um, <clears throat> my wife uh, Susan helps me, which I'm very grateful for, and she seems to enjoy it. So in this uh, instance, in the first batch, or no, I shouldn't say in the first batch because we randomize. Susan also helps in the the tasting process because she takes um, – duct tape and puts on the on the cap of each of these bottles that we get uh, and then randomly labels one, two, and three on the top. And so we don't know what we've got here. So in, in the Centennial batch, I used uh, 20 grams or a full ounce of Centennial at 8.1% 8, 8 alpha acid. In the Galaxy batch, I used 14 grams of Galaxy because it was at 15.7%. So it was almost twice as much alpha acid. And then in the third batch, I used 14 grams of Centennial plus 7 grams of Galaxy. So you see what I did there with the math? I just, in the first batch, I used a whole ounce of uh, Centennial, or 28 grams, half of that of uh, Galaxy in the second one because it's got twice as much alpha acid. And in the third batch, I halved the amount of uh, that I used in each of the single batches and put it into the third batch. So that third batch has 14 grams of Centennial and 7 grams of Galaxy. So our challenge before us is to figure out what we got going on here. And, you know, we have this, our sensory thing and we have a little bit of data. You know, we have the, um, um, you know, the descriptors of the hops. So we got three beers in front of us and they are darker than the beers that we usually uh, drink, can you, t Steve? Do you taste a difference in the in the malt profile? First of all, of of these beers compared to the the pills and light uh, dry malt extract that we usually drink? Yeah, I do. the the um, this They're a little bit more full bodied. They're a little bit. Uh, uh, more luscious, I guess I'd say. There, there's just uh, uh, a little more bready and uh, a little bit more grainy tasting. I can taste the grain mm -hmm. in them a little bit more than I could in a in a pilsner. It's a teeny tiny bit more caramely. Yeah, yeah, that's maybe a better way to put it. There, there's just a little bit. There's just a little bit more going on. It's not a lot. I mean, it's not like. You know, it's not like you you went from, uh, say, a Czech Pilsner to a Russian Imperial Stout to be dramatic. It's not some giant change, but but there's definitely a little bit more going on flavor wise. And it seems and to me we, we did we did one batch many many weeks ago or months ago or whatever where we did was it Vienna or Munich. Where we did a hop sampler with oh you know I forgot um, we did I think it was maybe Munich I think it was Munich and I I really didn't like that one yeah I remember that and, and I think it was Munich too and I didn't like it either it could and have been just, could have been Vienna just, you know listeners of the archives may know more than we but uh, yeah but <laughs> but I like this one I think in a way. It is more complementary. The malt bill is more complementary to the hops 
than the pills and light because I kind it's, of a, agree. it's a little more balanced. Uh, yeah, I kind of agree. And I agree also because it's a little bit more real world. Hmm. Um, you know, it's a little bit more like in, in terms of American brewing, you know, when you're going to brew a smash beer, you're probably going to brew it with two row or, or pale malt, the pale ale malt. And I know that there's a, a, um, the movement out there not to call it two row and I understand that but I sell two row Brees malt there's a lot of different malt houses uh, I just happen to sell sell Brees but but Brees two row is lighter and sweeter than Brees pale ale malt which is a little bit heavier still relatively sweet though um, and so it, it definitely makes a difference and I think that of, of these beers that I've tasted, they seem to really, I actually enjoy them more than I do the, the ones that we did with the Pilsner malt. Huh. They, they just seem a little bit more, uh, they, they're a little less, I'm looking for a word here, a little less harsh or a little less yeah. strident. One dimensional? One dimensional, yeah. So the, the malt character helps the hops a little bit. Yeah. I think, yeah. But maybe something we want to think about um, going into the next round. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, and, I think I think it's good that that we're at least you know as we go through this exercise that we're looking for a way to be informational or to to offer information, but also to offer it in a way that's really applicable to a to a common brew day. Yeah, it's not just for spreadsheets. It's not <clears throat> just for uh, esoteric. Learning, it's really applicable to what you're going to run into when you really brew a beer. Yeah, and and I kind of think that this pale ale version of the of the hop sampler is a little bit more real world. Hmm. So that's my soapbox, and I'll get off of it now. Yeah, well, I I I, I tend to agree with you. So what what are your thoughts on beer number one? I think that the wow, I think it's it, it's a tasty beer in general. The hops are, compared to two and three, I think they're a little less, I think they're a little more subdued. They're not quite as, uh, by subdued, I mean, they're not quite as in your face. They're definitely piney. That makes me think of Centennial. Uh, but I'm not ready to call this a Centennial beer, but they, there's some pine going on in there. Um, it's very drinkable. I get a little black pepper. I get a little bit of leather. Hmm. I get a little bit of... Um, <laughs> You're flashing back to the joy of home brewing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, it is embedded in my memory banks. <laughs> yeah, I get... I, uh, number it's, one, I definitely get pine. I get pine. I don't get... I don't really don't get any grapefruit. Maybe a, a little bit of, a little bit of grapefruity. I, but I do get some of that darker, that darker rub, leather, um, a little black pepper. I, somehow I always get black pepper. I think maybe it's my sinuses. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. That's post nasal drip. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Need some Dristan. <laughs> That's right. Do they still make Dristan? <laughs> God only knows. Mm, it is delicious. It's really a nice beer. It's not. Um, the hops are not overpowering in it. It plays really nicely with the malt. It's a little bit piney. That's what I know about it. Yeah, I think it's. It, I, I get. I definitely get the piney, almost resinous character mm. of it. Um, but good. It's, it's good. Yeah. So, do you have your hop descriptors in front of you? Do you want to? We I only. Do. We only have two hop descriptors this time. So, <laughs> sealed in the. Funkin' wag on the you know that thing. <laughs> yes, and uh, I've I've unsealed the mason jar, <laughs> the mayonnaise and, jar. <laughs> oh, mason, yeah, mayonnaise jar. Uh, Galaxy is the first descriptor. So, uh, Galaxy is descended from German variety Pearl. Mm. Although some people say Perle. 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 If they're fancy and they hold their pinky up when they drink coffee or tea. 
Uh, Galaxy is a unique Australian breed of hops that has this the distinction of sporting the highest percentage of essential oils in the industry. Oh, my God. Wow. Jeez, Louise. It has an amazing citrus, peach, and passion fruit aroma, especially when used as a late hop addition. The flavor is often quite intense upon production, but mellows as it matures. Galaxy. <laughs> in, in other words, drink it fast. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Um, Galaxy enjoyed her first commercial production in 2009 after nine years of testing and quickly became popular both in Australia and overseas. That is the official description. <laughs> from hopslist.com. Dot com. Stolen from hopslist.com. But it's not really that's, stolen if we give them credit. It's not stolen. That's her official, that's her press release. Um, yeah, Galaxy is one of those hops that people... As a retailer, I know this because I'm an expert. I'm an expert <laughs> retailer, people love Galaxy. They just like they. I've got customers that won't brew certain beers unless they can get Galaxy. And period. I think, and I think we've had Galaxy on this show, but uh, on the hop sampler, but we got a bad batch because the, right. the Galaxy that I used, I, or that I got, was like brown. Yes, it was. It was an old batch. I got it from the distributor, the wholesale distributor, and uh, and you were the one that that said something to me. Fine, you know, thank God. Um, but in the, and uh, in the tasting, it was cheesy. We got like it was cheesy. cheesy. It was bad. Yeah. And uh, I I called the the wholesale company and and told them what for, and I gave them sent them some pictures because it was brown. Yeah. And uh, they credited my account, and I threw them away. It's like 100 ounces. And well, the, it was well, so these, funny. Because, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it was so funny because they're like, well, we'll give you your money back and you can sell them if you want to. <laughs> like, no, I'm not going to sell these. <laughs> Crazy. That's <laughs> just what I want to do. Yeah. Here's some. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no. Uh, guess you're waiting. Get some crap. <laughs> some crap. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, the, there's no cheese in these beers, so no. Uh, we the, got we got good galaxy this time. Yeah, for sure. So, be, so beer number two. Beer number one. Oh well, I was just going to put a capstone on beer number one. Oh, okay. I think it's really nice. Yeah, it's really drinkable. Um, I don't get a huge, huge resin uh, pop like I think I do with with my my marker for Centennial is uh, too hard a nail. Oh yeah, for sure. Because that's a because I know that that's a pure centennial beer for sure. And I don't get that pure centennial build out of this one. That's all I have to say. Okay. Now I'm moving on to number two. Number okay. two. Number two. Oh. Very tasty. Oh, that to me is more fruity than number one. Yep. And sort of more balanced and easy drinking. It is, and it brings out the malt a little bit. I I get a little bit, I get a nice little bit of malt character, along with the hop character. They they seem like they're well. Maybe that's what you mean by more balanced. Yeah. It's just it just seems like I get a fuller uh, description mm. of the beer in my palate. Wow. Ooh. I like that quite a bit. I do too. I like that quite quite well. I don't mm. get a ton of the piney. Oh wow! Mm. No. Oh, and, uh, I like that quite a bit. Yeah, n- number two is just that's a really nice drinking beer. There's a, there's that's, more of a fruit character. Mm-hmm. Of course, I may be tipping my hand at this point, but <laughs> I think there's there's a little bit of the piney and some of the fruit character in there. I hmm. Uh, that's really good. That's it's, a very tasty beer. It's not challenging. Uh, no, that's right. It's not. You don't have to go. You don't have to be a beer geek to like it. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. And what I like about mm. it is that the hops don't overwhelm the malt in no. the beer. Mm. And so you get a really balanced flavor profile out of it. Yeah. I like it. That's really good. Okay, yeah. the second top descriptor. 
Okay. Se- second randomly selected hop descriptor. <laughs> Centennial owns its existence to a mix of Brewer's Gold, Fuggle, and East Kent Golding. Wow. And Bavarian hops, but they don't tell us what kind of Bavarian hops. They leave that alone. Developed in 1974 and released in 1990, Centennial was pioneered by Charles Zimmerman and S.T. Kinney at Washington State University. Wow. Hmm. No kidding. As, uh, it is at times referred to as Super Cascade because of its similar citric characteristic. Centennial is a much celebrated hop in its versatility with its depth of bitterness and forward aroma. Well, I could say that about my brother John, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we don't call him Centennial, though. Um, bitterness and forward hop aroma, two characteristics that balance each other beautifully. It is well suited. <laughs> it is well suited to pale ales and IPAs, with its high alpha content and its floral, in both flavor and aroma. Centennial has its ups and downs in the commercial brewing industry, but is currently experiencing a return to popularity, particularly among leading craft breweries. Hmm. So yeah, I I call it Super Cascade. I definitely do. I think of it as Cascade on steroids. I'm tasting number three. Me too. Boy, that's a different beer. That's a different beer. Huh. Number three, I'm getting um, really ripe persimmon, maybe, but but ripe fruit. Yep, I, I can go there. I've had a lot of ripe persimmons in my life, and I think that does have some persimmony flavor it, it's real it's real fruity the the uh compared to number two which still retained quite a bit of the malt character this one seems like it's really dominated by the hop character hmm. to me hmm. um it's it has kind of a bubblegum character that the hops do oh Mm, I went. I, I just. I just went from number number three to number two. Number two has much more more of a piney thing going on. Yeah, it does. But it, again, it leaves it leaves room for the for the malt, which which is interesting to me because the other two beers don't. The other two beers, the hops dominate. Hmm. The malt so much that that all I get is malt out of. I mean, all I get is hops out of them. Mm-hmm. Number two, I get both a nice hop character and a nice bready milk, bready malt character. I think we're we're talking ourselves into a certain direction that maybe the <laughs> maybe the listeners can detect. <laughs> well, maybe so, but but that's how that's what I think. Um, Gosh. But then you taste number one, and especially if you pour, I've got these little plastic cups. Yeah, I'm using plastic. And if I pour from the bottle to refresh the uh, the beer in the plastic cup, it kind of sharpens up the, the flavor of the beer. Well, I wish I had a really strong opinion about what was what. I don't. Hmm. But I could tell you that all three, that these are three. Three very different beers. And my trouble is that I I I honestly don't know which is which. Um I I have an idea, but but I don't have any confidence in it. I don't want to sway you, but here's the way I'm leaning. I'm thinking that one and two have centennial in it, and number three is the galaxy. And I'm kind of Hmm. After tasting between the one and two, I'm kind of leaning toward number one being just the Centennial and number two being the blend. But then I go back and taste again. Number two, wow. number two is my favorite. Number two is my favorite too, and I and I would have said to you the exact same thing. Ah, okay. So that's exactly what I thought too. Was that number two was the blend? And uh, number one was Centennial, and number three was Galaxy. 
Okay, we're most most confident on number three. Would you say? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, which which, which so, I have, I don't have any strong confidence in, but yes, <laughs> I think number three is is Galaxy. So let's unveil number. I have the cap for number three. Okay, I've got it. And it's Galaxy. Woo! Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Oh, so it is it is super fruity. Yep. And and uh, I think John Palmer. I think it was Mosaic that that everybody loves. And John Palmer told me, I think maybe on the show, that he didn't like Mosaic because it tasted like rotten fruit yeah, <laughs> or like over it. overripe fruit. And yeah, so uh, this is borderline. This sample is borderline. That is just like it needs something. It needs something with it to brighten yeah. it up a bit. I agree. Yeah, it's kind of yes, it's kind of. I don't know. It's it's I, flat's not the right word because that implies that the beer's flat, but the hop character is kind of flat. It it's yeah. just yeah, it's, it's just, just mushy. Like, it's mushy, mushy. Yeah, like over overripe fruit. Yeah. Now, wow. now, okay, we got the other two. Oh my gosh! Which e- each one does have centennial. Let's see if we can discern which is the centennial only. Okay. All right. We need a drum roll. Well, I know how I'm going to vote. Okay, me too. I voted last time. You you go this time. I vote that number two is the blended beer. I do too. Okay. I do too. All right, here we go. It's just so nicely balanced and interesting. It's Centennial by itself. Oh! <laughs> Holy moly! <laughs> what the what? I am shocked. Oh, Hmm. I mean, I am shocked. The G and wow. yeah, the first one is the G, the blend. I am really shocked that. Huh. I I mean I can't believe I got to take the the tape off just to. Yeah. Holy moly! Wow. Well, Centennial, the the straight Centennial was definitely my favorite. Huh. Like like not even close. Wow. Me too. Wow. Well, now we know why uh, Bell's Too Hard at Ale is a great <laughs> centennial. <laughs> you know, I mean, okay, let me taste the, the blend again. I am shocked. That's, that's, that blows me away. I could, tell, I could tell that the first two beers had centennial in it because that piney yeah. character in it. But in this case, one and one doesn't equal three. Right. Uh, hmm. That is Number, wild. The, the straight centennial beer with the pale ale, pale ale malt is a winner. Hmm. I, I mean, I really like that beer a lot. I don't know what it, I don't know what the, I don't know what the compounds that are in there that multiply together, you know, when you put those two hops together, but they just weren't as appealing as that single hop by itself. No, they weren't. <clears throat> Not at all. I mean, to be fair, all three beers are perfectly drinkable beers. To be fair. <laughs> to be fair. I mean, really, true, they are. But, boy, number two just had, I still picked up all the malt character. It, it still had that nice breadiness, which I, which I really like in a beer. Now, that could be a, a personal choice thing. I like beers that still retain a kind of bread-like character, a kind of breadiness. And I really like that in a beer. And so number two did that. And yet it also had a nice strong hop character that stood out and stood up to the, the malt, stood up to the breadiness, but didn't, but didn't eviscerate it, didn't mm-hmm. take it away. And that was the appeal to me. I expected that to be the blended beer. Yeah. That's what I thought it was going to be weird, weird. But yeah, number number well, that's two. Why we do no, this exercise. Number two was my favorite. Number one was my second, and then number yeah, me too. Th- and then number three, the galaxy by itself was was my third. I think the galaxy needs a piney and for my palate in this application with this recipe on that day. Right, the galaxy needs a piney character to to bump it up 
a notch. Yeah. That's just crazy. I'm just, boy, not what I was expecting. No. Not at all. Wow. Huh. You know what, I, what I'm learning from this hop sampler over time and all the episodes we've done and all the hops that we've experienced, I'm finding that noble hops or, I mean, Centennial's not, not really a noble hop, but the closest thing we've got in American hops, I mean, the, the hops that are traditional and used a lot, you know, there's a reason for that mm -hmm. and and they are they always come through so tetning and hollow tower and all its forms and sots and cascade and centennial willamette north and uh, northern brewer and uh mount hood those kinds of hops they just always work <laughs> they just they just always work and and that's why they sell or, or that's why they're consumed. Um, wow, I'm just really blown away. I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked, shocked, shocked. I thought for sure that Centennial and Galaxy was going to be number two. And I, but you know that. But saying you know saying that, I would be happy to have brewed five gallons of e any of these. Right, that's the thing. That, that we I, we kind of always have to throw that out there as a disclaimer. We're really splitting hairs. These are all three quite nice beers. Mm -hmm. They're all three really good beers. Yeah, I would drink any one of them without any complaint, ever. But since we have all three in front of us and we can make a choice, hmm. I would definitely choose number two, this the straight Centennial beer. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that the straight Galaxy or the straight blended beer aren't good beers because they are and it doesn't mean that that two other guys with different palates and different uh i don't know taste needs i don't know what else to say that wouldn't choose differently right but but uh because <clears throat> there's because these are well brewed you, you i mean you did a good job of brewing them there's no flaws they're not in, they're not infected or anything weird like that and, and they're all good beers but but you and I, on this day, on this tasting, we agreed that number two, the Centennial with Pale Ale Malt, tasted the best to us. Yeah. And I just took a sip of the Galaxy, and it's a good beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, side, side by side with the others, you know, you can, you can pick nits, and you can, uh, you can, yeah. you know. Wow. Holy cats. How fun was that? That was really fun. It was very instructive. Yeah. I learned a lot. So so email us in, you know, at james at uh, basicbrewing.com. Email me your, uh, your, your consideration for the uh, the, the blending that you want to uh, do with the, the next hop sampler blending <laughs> thing. <clears throat> and uh, we'll see what we can, what weird combinations we can come up with. Uh, but, you know, and, and uh, I, I'm sure... They'll all be good beers. <laughs> That's the good yeah. thing. <laughs> and we got to decide whether we want to go back to Pilsen Light or stick with the pale ale. Yeah, good question. I don't know. Maybe we do Pilsen Light if we're doing noble hops, if oh. we're doing continental hops. Oh. And maybe we do pale ale if we're doing British hops and American hops. Ooh, Interesting. Something like that. Oh, okay. We're just we're just making stuff up as we go along. <laughs> well, that's that's how you do it. That's that's how we've been doing it for fifteen years. Has oh, it been that long? Oh, which by the way, it's past the anniversary date <laughs> by the time this show is aired. Uh yeah, so yeah, fifteen yeah, it's we're basic brewing radios now into its sixteenth year. <laughs> Jesus. I don't know Christ. whether to be happy or sad about it. <laughs> I'm happy that it's been going on so long and so strong, but sad that that so much of my life is gone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I see my kids grow up and it's like, oh, that you know, my son, you know, my youngest yeah. son, I no longer have teenage you and I neither have teenagers anymore for kids. No. 
Yeah, it's like sunrise, sunset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, at oh, least Lord. it's not cats in the cradle. <laughs> That's right. Or, honey, I miss you. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't want that. <laughs> All right, Steve. All right, Thank James. you so much. Uh, go see Steve's uh, shop at stevesbrewshop.com. Dot com. Send him some love, and uh, we will talk to you next time. Absolutely. Cheers. Well, thanks again to Steve of stevesbrewshop.com. If you have a suggestion for a fun hop pairing, let me know. That was a lot of fun. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. Thank you.